international visitors for the first time since travel restrictions were imposed at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020. Reuters correspondent Rachel Judah has more. The easing of restrictions marks the final unraveling of the country's controversial zero COVID policy. For the past few years, it's shielded China's 1.4 billion people from the virus, but also cut them off from the rest of the world. Now, incoming travelers will no longer need to quarantine, only provide a negative PCR test taken within the previous 48 hours. At Beijing Capital International Airport, long-awaited reunions at the arrivals hall that would have been impossible just a day ago are finally a reality. Reuters correspondent Rachel Judah. Officials in Senegal and President Macky Sall said in statements 38 people died and about 80 were wounded in central Senegal after two buses collided in the early hours of Sunday. The crash, one of the deadliest in the West African country's recent memory, was on one of the main east-west arteries about 220 kilometers southeast of the capital, Dakar. The UN says one of its top officials has met with the Taliban government's higher education minister. VOA's Marissa Melton has more. The minister says the ban is necessary to prevent the mixing of genders in universities and because he believes some subjects violate Islamic principles. There's also a ban on Afghan women working for national and international non-governmental groups. The U.N. mission in Afghanistan said Saturday the U.N. special envoy called for the urgent lifting of these bans as the country is entering a new period of crisis. Marissa Melton, VOA News. This is VOA News. U.S. President Joe Biden is heading to the U.S.-Mexico border later Sunday for a first-hand look at border security. The stop in El Paso, Texas will be his first visit to the border as president. Republicans have hammered him as soft on security, while a large number of migrants are crossing in spirals. El Paso is currently the biggest corridor for illegal migrants, because large part because of Nicaraguans fleeing their country. They're among migrants from four countries who are now sub- subjected to quick expulsion from the border under new U.S. rules. Allies of Britain's royal family are pushing back against claims made by Prince Harry in his new memoir. VOA's Tommy McNeil explains. The book paints the monarchy as a cold and callous institution. Buckingham Palace has not officially commented on spare, but British newspapers and websites brimmed Saturday with quotes from unnamed royal insiders who rebutted Harry's accusations. Harry has said he expects counterattacks from the palace over the book, which is due to be published on Tuesday. The Associated Press obtained an early copy of the book, which recounts Harry's grief at the death of his mother in 1997. It all describes the tense relationship with elder brother Prince William and growing disenchantment with royal life. Tommy McNeil, VOA News, Washington. Australia's northwest is facing a one-in-100-year flood crisis, according to an official, as many communities were stranded and prompted hundreds of evacuations, authorities said on Sunday. The crisis in the Kimberley, an area in western Australia state about the size of California, was sparked last week by a severe weather system with a former tropical cyclone that brought heavy rain. Now, as we know, people in the Kimberley are experiencing a one in 100 year flood event. The worst flooding Western Australia has had in its history. Western Australia Emergency Services Minister Stephen Dawson, the Fitzroy Crossing, a community of around 1,300 people, has been among the worst hit with supplies having to be airlifted due to flooded roads. Iraqi authorities have reopened Baghdad's heavily fortified green zone in an attempt to ease traffic jams in the capital. The heavily fortified area was closed and opened several times in the past years. Starting in the early hours of Sunday, Iraqi authorities removed checkpoints and opened major roads and tunnels that cut through the green zone. I'm Joe Ramsey, VOA News.
Kalanganen kubur koros, mengko mecah cawat dan sok mecahin. Rongan way laut kan terfiwi news insan seler ni pecon way pp wang kuprakan sang elingan pon p. Fisik se radio, kelangan station dan sok search manage a sok mon kelak a sok yo. Cepang kacin prince way nan sok mecahin programin komaj.
Production collaboration, bad on the beats. Yeah, tell them. Yes, I. Woman, I got me say. The pin set five connection. Uh. Just go up on it. every time we have one, we get turned up. But I 
they put a crown on me. I'm a build a local house and pay the love on it. Change the other pay that put I next to you. Nigga, that's the thing, yo, Junga Ling a Ling. Lunch at Fusion and dinner Flamingo. Wine and dine, they go, wine and dine, they go. But if you're tired, Nago, I can walk you back home to the Evans Hotel. Let me tell you, Nago, I'ma give you everything, yeah. I'ma give you what you want, yeah. I'ma show you paradise, yeah. No matter what it takes, girl, I'ma be right by your side, yeah. If you wanna be my bonnet, big girl, yeah. Say the baby, my say, mom. Yeah, my bonnet, big girl, Productions right back at it again. We got your boy, Rude Boy, Raynard Steven, Wawa, and Gordon. On the next episode of Voice of the City. program <laughs> Yay, program and voice of the sea, Megan Sansan, Ni Pachon Wai. Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. 
Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're looking at how pollution on the west side of Maui, including sewage, agriculture, and sediment runoff is affecting the coral reef ecosystem. We're at the Kahekili Herbivore Fisheries Management Area. In 2009, Kahekili became a protected area for herbivorous algae-eating fishes in order to help increase the reef's ability to fight off excessive algal growth. We start off with Tova Calendar from the West Maui Ridge to Reef Initiative, talking to Sea Grant staff about the efforts to better understand the scope of the problem and what the local community is doing to respond. My name is Tova Callender, and I coordinate the West Maui Ridge to Reef Initiative. And what is the Ridge to Reef Initiative? The Ridge to Reef Initiative is a collaborative effort including federal, state, and local partners trying to find and address the sources of land-based pollution negatively impacting our coastal environment. What kind of a background do you have to have your position? My background is in environmental science and management. So I am necessarily a generalist who has worked on the business side as well as the you know, legal side, social side, and the science side. So I look to everyone else to inform their really deep knowledge in all the different subject matters and play air traffic control to bring those pieces together so that we can leverage what everyone is doing and get to solutions faster. So we are focused in these five watersheds, Wahikuli down to Honolulu. There are very big problems down here. Um, a few years ago, at one bay in particular, there were 23 brown water events in a single year. Huge brown plumes coming out. Each of those gulches and streams, and you saw there were many on the map, have been modified by the human activity above, the, the farming practices that resulted in pushing a lot of that uh, fine silts and sediment material into the, into the banks. And so the bed and the banks of all of those gulches are lined to various degrees with readily mobilizable fine silt that makes its way to the coast. One of the exciting things that's been happening over time is, as I said, we're getting more information in. So we finally have uh, coastal water quality data for 18 months. This information has just come in. This is the first map, yep. hot off the press. We have some pretty serious nitrogen issues in a few sections of our coastline. We're looking at nitrogen isotope testing in the areas with the highest nitrogen levels at the coastline to see whether or not we can start figuring out the flavor of the nitrogen, which will lead us towards the, towards the source. And pretty much everywhere exceeds the turbidity standards set by the State Department of Health. We've also had uh, USGS partnered with DAR and others doing uh, fat bags, semi-permeable membrane devices that they float out in locations offshore here, leave for 30 days, and it works like any bioaccumulating organism would work, where it, it absorbs into the fat. And they're testing for different classes. So what they're coming up with are, and it, of course it varies by area. Here we have extra hits of things. You know, here it's caffeine, it's anti-seizure medication, flame retardants. Uh, perfume ingredients, There's all kinds of medications come up here because the wastewater treatment plant comes here, you, maybe you'll get to swim in it later. Atrazine, uh, simazine, um, you know, a lot of the ag chemicals also coming up uh, in the different locations. I keep an active website at westmauiR2R.com. You can find me through there, you can find more information. My name is Darla and I am um, with the Division of Aquatic Resources. The Division of Aquatic Resources, our kuleana, is to manage the life in the water from the shoreline to three miles out. My team, what we get to do the fun, sciencey part of it. We're actually in the water most of the time, um, collecting data and looking at trends in fish populations and coral health over time. Coral Reef Assessment and Monitoring Program, CRAMP, it's those data that showed that we had lost close to 50% of our coral cover at this particular site over a period of 10 to 15 years, which is really fast. So that spurred looking into why is this happening? We were having a lot of invasive algal blooms at the time. There was science looking at how do you deal with that? These particular algal species, your Acanthophora specifera, uh, they were doing taste tests, if you will, over at HIMB and found that, well, fish love to eat it. This is a good thing. If fish love to eat it, if you protect the herbivores, then maybe we can get ahead of the curve here, right? The area itself, the management area, starts just south of Black Rock, where the Sheraton is, 
and continues up north to Honokawai Park. So it's about two miles. In the seven years that we've had it going now, we've seen incredible results a lot sooner than we would have imagined. Um, we've seen a 138% increase in parrotfish biomass. We've seen a little over 40% increase in uh, surgeonfish biomass. So parrots, surgeons, and chubs were the protected species or families here. We've seen um, size classes uh, grow. So your larger parrot fishes are more abundant now. Although the last two years, the data show there's been some poaching. But um, we've also seen uh, something really incredible, which starting to see everywhere, but here more than anywhere, is an increase in crustose coralline algae. So we're seeing uh, these uh, resilience indicators, you know, crustose being very important to new larval recruitment. If you're looking at an oblique angle, you will see it looks pretty good, right? It looks all nice pastels. But if you look straight down into it, you're going to notice there's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of algae growing in between. There's a lot of partial mortality of the colonies. And it's really easy to look at all the light colored stuff. It grabs your eye. But I want you guys to look at the darker colored stuff, the, the browns and grays and the algae and the mortality. I want you to kind of grasp what we're dealing with. Coral is a living animal. It is a living animal. And it's a very, very amazing, resilient, incredible animal that we have been hammering to death. And they're just about to give up. <laughs> so, so, but seriously, I mean, they're so amazing that if we remove the stressors, we see time and time again that they have the ability to, to rebound, to grow and be healthy again. And when it comes to our coral reefs, resilience is the key, right? Managing for resilience. A healthy ecosystem, if it's whole in its system, all of its parts are there and working, it's in better health to deal with the global stressors that we're gonna have to deal with. We have natural bioeroders, our parrotfish are out there chomping on the algae and taking that, that calcium carbonate substrate and pooping it out and making sand. We've got a lot of calcium carbonate based limu or algae that grow here that create sand. Um, it is very cool. When we go out, I'm gonna take you on the outer side of the reef first. We'll take a look at one dead zone and get familiar with what that looks like. Then we're gonna take a cruise just to see what this whole reef looks like, to see why we're fighting so hard for this reef because there's a lot we're saving. And then I'll show you a second dead zone, which is in front of this first building on the outer portion of the reef. We call it the, um, the boneyard because a lot of the skeletons are still standing, um, but they're, they're mostly dead. But that area still gets recruitment, which is pretty amazing. And then we'll kind of uh, angle in towards the, uh, far co the northern corner of the second building to see where uh, the, these se prominent seeps are that the EPA has been sampling for the last couple of years, looking at the wastewater coming in. We might not be able to see much, but do look for the nitrogen bubbles coming out of the substrate. It's very indicative of, of the, uh, what's happening. Grab your snorkel to check out the effects of algae overgrowth and sewage seeping into the waters of Kahekili. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program, focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities. Through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. Darla White from the Division of Aquatic Resources talks us through our snorkel of Kahekili. Can you kind of walk me through our snorkel and so what, what we saw in sort of each Sure. <laughs> so, so where the dive flags are out in the water there is a, it's a sand channel, really wide sand channel. And the dive flags are there because there's, uh, they call it the classroom. But oh. <laughs> just on the southern side of those dive flags is an, a dead zone uh, we call the sand channel. <laughs> and it is, um, it, it's just these areas where you have a lot of mortality. It's just kind of, it's crumbled. It looks like a grenade went off. In fact, in that particular one, we had that very large coral head that's fallen mm -hmm. over as well. Traversed the reef and got a good look at what's going on, what the reef looks like, how much we have we're saving, you know? I'm really, really trying to get folks to look at the coral colonies themselves and what's live and what's dead because we have a lot of fragmentation of the, the coral tissue. Uh, itself, so you'll have like a colony, but a lot of partial mortality. Parts of it have died back, 
and, and that can actually impact the coral's ability to reproduce and grow. When we get over in front of this first building on the outer edge of the reef is an area we like to call the boneyard. And you're cruising along, you're seeing all the pretty pastels of live coral and all of a sudden it's dark and gray. And in this particular area, a lot of those uh, skeletons of the coral colonies are still standing upright. So if you were able to free dive down and look at it, it just looks kind of ghostly. And even the one coral colony that we had over there finally fell over. So that was, uh, that was the first time I've seen that, actually. So it's like, and you're down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, we um, head over towards uh, where they were sampling from the wastewater seat in front of the second building on the north corner. And along the way, um, like to show folks areas of these dead zones, these areas that are really highly impacted with high mortality. When you start to come in more shallow, we have a lot larger uh, colonies, a lot of the lobe corals. And a lot of these colonies, some of them are really big and some of them are really resistant. They look pretty happy out there, but most of them don't. Most of them look like little patchworks, little quilts, or what I like to call them a pizza. And, <laughs> You know, these are really, really, really slow growing colonies. They did not get that big in that condition, right? And now they're looking really sad. Unfortunately, today we had a lot of uh, really uh, high turbidity in the shallow area where that freshwater seep is, so it wasn't any good to, couldn't even find it. But if it had been clear, what would we have seen? So if it would have been clear, so just um, on that area where the reefs Stops and we have this like a, a cap rock kind of environment before the sand, uh, which is in about four to five feet of water, depending on the tide. Um, uh, you see uh, bubbles, air bubbles, nitrogen bubbles coming out of the surface. You see blurry water. The fresh water is blurry because mm -hmm. it's a different density of the salt water. And um, this water is unusually warm. Oh. <laughs> It's 83 degrees night and day. <laughs> usually springs are in the 60s, right? Right, they're usually colder. Yeah, this one's not cold at all. <laughs> How come? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Um, lots of people have thought maybe it's the bacterial um, activity that's heating it up. Don't really, there hasn't been anything definitive that I've heard of. The reef used to come up closer than it does now. And folks that have been coming here for more, you know, 25, 30 years will all tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. The reef used to come up almost to the shoreline. So it's, it's not now, it's back a bit. And everything in that transition zone between this, this kind of pavement area and the reef looks pretty sad. Looks really degraded. Yeah, I was really surprised. I, I, as you're saying, on the way out, there were patches of healthy parts and then there were patches of sort of those boneyard areas. But on the way back in the shallower area, especially as we approach the sand channel, there was so much algae growing on top of the corals. Yeah, yeah it's good fish food. <laughs> <laughs> if you have the herbivores. Yes, if you have the herbivores, exactly. <laughs> the herbivores are doing pretty good around the, the algae, but they've got lots of food. <laughs> When we were out there, there was a lot of dead coral. A lot of dead coral, yes. Uh -huh. And is that typical of what you would like to see? <laughs> <laughs> no. Reef that isn't growing is eroding, right? And, and so, and you notice when you're out there, a lot of those areas we're calling little dead zones, they're, they're actually kind of concave. We're losing the complexity. When those areas over in these recent couple of years have been covered in the crustose, it's like, okay, there's hope, there's a lot of hope. Do you have any idea why, like as we were swimming, there would be an area where the coral seems to be doing pretty well and everything's kind of healthy and then just right adjacent to that, right next door, you know, there's like Prides heads that had fallen over or a lot of algae on the coral. And so do you understand why it's so patchy like that? We do have some, some hypotheses that, that there's probably localized acidification in areas out there. The finger coral, the Parides compressa, is being affected most because it's high surface area to volume ratio and um, porous skeleton. Mm -hmm. You would almost expect it's the more fragile and would be affected first. And that's the areas that are really crumbling. And we do have a significant freshwater source here with the West Lahaina Wastewater Reclamation Facility, just a quarter mile up the road. We know it's coming in on the reef here. We can measure it really uh, fairly easily in the nearshore area where there's not 
reef structure. It's a little bit harder to look out over the reef structure and tell what's going on. There's some, been some really great research here that's pointed to um, anthropogenic inputs. Like the wastewater treatment. Like the wastewater treatment. Um, Megan Daylor uh, used our native ulva to, to give us some stable nitrogen isotope signals and showed that it's, it's a uh, wastewater or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Metabolic waste, um, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, the highest, the highest M15 values in the literature. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, and some uh, in one spot by double. So, yeah. And and you know, uh, USGS Chip Hunt came out here and did a lot of uh, chemical work with the water and found everything from, um, you know, fabric brightener to pharmaceuticals to um, flame retardant. It's wastewater, you know, and it's not just about the nutrients in there. It's every other toxicant that anybody puts down their drain. I mean, from, from, from insecticides to paint to obviously fabric brightener to pharmaceuticals to, you know, there's all kinds of things in that water that aren't treated. Right, I've been to talks and heard about, you know, people are studying, well, how does your medicine affect fish or affect sharks or affect marine mammals? And I'm super interested in that. Yeah, the, the um, uh, endocrine disruptors. Right. Right? And, and I would love to see some work done on that here. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had some great new research by Craig Glenn from UH Manoa on an EPA-funded project looking at the time of travel between the wastewater injection wells and the reef using a dye tracer study. And they've definitively shown that it is going from A to B, and the time of travel is about three months. So they actually put dye in and track it. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they certainly did. <laughs> so, so what, I mean, there's all of the research that's been done here has pointed to that as a major stressor. The county's been working with the EPA on, on getting the wastewater disinfected. So they put in UV filters, and while they were constructing that, they did uh, put bleach in the water to eliminate some of the health hazards to people. We've already seen some significant bleaching events these last couple of years. Our reefs need our help as much as possible now. We need to, we need to stop overfishing. We need to uh, reduce land-based sources of pollution. We need to remove the stressors from our reefs, period, and so that they have a better chance of buying them more time to, deal, to be healthier and deal with the global stressors because acidification and warming oceans are coming. And why are reefs so important? They, I mean, in Hawaii, I can't, I mean, the depth and of the importance, I mean, from cultural to subsistence to recreation and just joy, but the biodiversity and itself, in and of itself, a quarter of all of our species are found nowhere else on the planet. It's an amazing ecosystem all in itself. It acts as a barrier to to waves and shoreline erosion. They're the cities for everything that lives out there. For people who want to get involved and make a difference, what can they do? There's many, many things that you can do to make a difference. Number one, reduce your CO2 emissions. <laughs> Number one, that matters. It really, really matters um, how much CO2 we're putting into our atmosphere. So um, your energy choices are really important. Your choices as a consumer are incredibly important. Use use earth and ocean friendly products. It matters what goes down your drain because here in the islands, it goes right there. And, <laughs> and third, just be Pono. If you fish, just take what you need, you know? Yeah. Got it, we have to malama this. We wanna keep it. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Foote. And I coordinate two complementary programs focused on this area in West Maui. One is the Makai Watch program, which focuses on what's in the ocean and, and promoting the effectiveness of the Kaakili Herbivore Fisheries Management Area. What I do is I help coordinate an effort to engage community members and individuals because we all can make a difference. So the first program I was going to share with you folks about is the Makai Watch program. Has anyone heard of it? 
It's a, okay, good. <laughs> it's a statewide program. So it's sort of like neighborhood watch in the ocean where you have community groups who care about a particular area. It's in need of stewardship and support. Folks get trained as far as how to identify violations and report violations, working with DOCARE, working with Division of Aquatic Resources and Darla's group too, as far as the biological monitoring. There's citizen science, there's outreach and education. People do things to help management, they care about the area. We try to get the word out in various ways. We host public events, volunteer opportunities. People can come do beach cleanups, and we have a big annual event here called the Ridge Sharif Rendezvous to really get people involved and aware. Um, we've had a fishing tournament, so all the different you know, stakeholder type uh, folks can get engaged and try to help spread the message about what this area is, how it's unique, why it's important, and why everyone should kind of help play a role to take care of it. It's, it's daunting all that we need to do in the watershed from Malka to Mackay to kind of help bring our ecosystems back. But there are things people can do and we need to be optimistic and collectively we can make a difference if we take these steps and get involved. And in addition to that personal level to contribute, it's also about getting involved in the bigger decisions. So engaging with your council people, asking for more progressive planning, enforcement of construction practices and other things. So it's beyond just what we're doing, it's what we're doing as a community. If we don't start doing something pretty quickly, we're not gonna have what we love left. And so time is of essence. I just got out of the water and I can't say in like eight years since I first snorkeled here with you, um, it's changed dramatically. Okay. And the coral, there's so much less coral and so much more algae. It happens gradually, and if you lose sight of what things used to be, it's easy to just be complacent, but to realize things have changed over time, and we really need to take steps to protect it now before we forget what good used to be. Can I say the other neat thing she did? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that, that I've seen happen, and it, partly it's in thanks to Liz having really deep roots in this area, is it used to sort of feel like there were the water people and there were the mountain people. And it's been really neat to see that bridge build. And the people who volunteer in the water are now volunteering in the mountain, and the people in the mountain are more interested in what's happening. And so, it, I don't know, it seems like a new thing that people are actually honestly thinking in the way we kind of need to if we're gonna be addressing these problems. If your projects are successful, what do you hope to see? And then on the flip side is, in worst case scenario, what could it look like? Well, best case, <laughs> herbivores grazing the reef and keeping the turf algae at bay, and the crustose coralline algae is continuing to grow and create that perfect substrate for all the larvae to come and land from all the other reefs that are seeding it that are also healthy. <laughs> and we have you know, more fish and more diversity and resilience, and we have some changes made to the injection well so that uh, disposal onto the reef is no longer uh, the current practice. If we don't get our act together, both Malka, you know, up watershed and Mackay, our fishing practices, our land use practices, we'll continue to see degradation. Like this reef has shown signs of res resilience, which is great, but it's still threatened. It's still here where it, it should be here. <laughs> and that's what we're aiming for. So it's, it could easily continue on a path where if we don't do proactive measures and, and all together holistically, we could lose the reef. We've seen so much of it degrade already. I've lived here 20 years and it's been really sad and alarming and the sense of urgency should not be you know, understated that we, we really need to take care of our reefs, this one, everyone in the state. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group, teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Hello, I'm Kubul Koros, Menga Meche, Chow the Vin Sok Meche, Programming Foys of the Sea, Nasan Salem, Nipa Chonway, Pepe Wong, Brakan Sang, Elingan Ponpe, Physic Sage Radio, Logan Station and Sok Sage Minute Silo, Mon Clock A Sakriya.
Naki chai nyong nan gamati pije dan wardi yonan we pije dan gasale dan noma nene no easy going yo oh is me going on my god ana boy die is going up boy da go mel la uga bure yong ba
Productions right back at it again. We got your boy, Root Boy, Raynard Steven, Wawa, and Gordon. Nan nan ji hyung ye me 
Production collaboration, bad on the beats.
shall be based solely on qualification and experience. In making appointments, first consideration shall, shall be given to those applicants who are Pompey citizens. Only after it has been determined that there are no qualified Pompey, Pompeian citizens interested in the position shall second consideration be given to Ravisum citizens and third to be given U.S. citizens and other third country citizens. Position and salary, security guard, pay level 5, step 2, number of position 1, location, division of budget and administration, Pompey legislator. The security guard shall report to the division of budget and administration, specifically a security guard provide for the safety and security of legislative buildings, vehicles, and other properties. Keep unauthorized personnel out of the legislator's office complex at night and during weekends and holidays. Check to see that buildings are locked and air conditioners shut off at night and during weekends and holidays. Report on report all unusual occurrences or in or incidents to the Department of Public Safety as soon as possible. Maintain security during functions and activities of the legislator. Maintain a log of activities and undertake other services listed or authorized in the contract. Qualifications must be a high school graduate with some college experience prefer preferred and at least two years of work-related experience. How to apply application forms can be obtained and returned to the Division of Administration and Budget of the Bombay Legislature no later, no later than January 20, 2023 at 5 p.m. Pagayat sa Department of Public Safety, Pompey State Government, Tagampang Kulukul o Nabagma o Malaylay, May Patyan Masanuway, Recruitment Announcement, It is the policy of Department of Public Safety, Pompey State Government, that all positions shall be recruited by advertisement for a period of not less than 30 calendar days and must take the written examination before filling out an application. Position and salary, correction officer one, pay level nine, step one, $260.06 plus, plus $100 cola. This is the minimum salary rate at step one of the grade. Higher steps not exceed step four may be authorized in case of hard to fill positions where it is appropriate to the qualification of the appointee. Location, Department of Public Safety, Division of Correction and Rehabilitation, Pompey State Government. Example of duties, responsible for compound, compound security, inmates, detainees, awaiting trials and mental patients, safety and security at the Division of Correction and Rehabilitation Facility. Key control, main gate control, transportation to hospital and to either national or state court, general population control, solitary and detainee cells. Will work with adult male and female facilities. Will work with adult and male female facility with some facilities having special needs of vendors responsible for upholding order and supervising offenders in a safe correctional environment. 
advises and instructs offenders in their judgment to institute to institutional living supervises and escorts offenders in various work de details keep records prepares reports on offenders movements progress problem and or violation of rules visitors processing packages searches for contraband and lock control must be able to defend must be able to defend oneself physically act quickly and if effective effectively in an emergency situation be willing to participate and successfully complete all required training programs and performs other related duties as assigned from supervisor minimum qualification requirements graduate from high school or equivalent must have valid driver valid driver's license must have must be in between 21 to 35 years of age must have COVID-19 vaccination card written examination will be held at Department of Public Safety conference room the, the exam will be conducted on January 21st and 28 2023 at 9 a.m. if you have any questions you may contact the tele telephone number 32039 one zero or to email espermanis.bnidbs at gmail.com all lowercase for your information Kalan. recruitment announcement it is the policy of Department of Public Safety, Bombay State Government, that all positions shall be recruited by advertisement for a, peri for a period of not less than 30 calendar days and must take the written examination before filling out an application. Position and salary, police officer 1, 8 available positions, B level 9, step 1. $260.06 plus COLA $100. This is the minimum salary rate at step 1 of the grade. Higher steps not exceed step 4 may be authorized in case of hard to fill positions where it is appropriate for the qualification of the appointee. Location Department of Public Safety, Division of Police and Security and Division of Correction and Rehabilitation of the State Government. Example of duties, patrol assigned areas and enforce FSM state laws and municipal ordinance. Enforce laws pertaining to traffic including moving and violations. Maintain laws and order and protect life and property. Answers complaint in a field and conduct on the spot in the and conduct on the spot investigation assist any officer in conducting preliminary investigations of crimes assist in making arrests and guarding prisoners direct and controls the movement of vehicles and pedestrians testifies in a, in court as government witness stand guard in government areas participate in search and rescue of persons reported missing on land or at sea is occasionally occasionally assigned to all outer islands to provide additional manpower may assist in firefight may be required to participate in surveillance and stake out of criminal activities participates in roadblocks and provide protection to the public at areas where hazardous hazardous explosives are in progress Performs other, performs other related duties as assigned. Minimum qualifications. Graduate from high school or equivalent must have valid driver's license. Must be between 21 to 35 years of age. Must have COVID-19 vaccination card. Written examination will be held at Department of Public Safety conference room. 
The exam will be conducted on January 21st and 28, 2023 at 9 a.m. If you have any questions, you may contact telephone number 320-3910 or, at, or to email espermanis.pnidbs at gmail.com all your case for your information. Pilbagayar sang Department of Department of Public Safety, Takamban Kolokol Unabaku Malaylay. Recruitment announcement It is the policy of Department of Public Safety, Bombay State Government, that all positions shall be recruited by advertisement for a period of not less than 30 calendar days and must take the written examination before filling out an application. Position and salary firefighter 1, 2 available positions. Pay level 9, step 1, $260.06 by weekly plus $100 COLA. This is the minimum salary rate at step 1 of the grade. Higher steps not exceed step 4 may be authorized in case of hard to fill positions where it is appropriate to the qualification of the appointee. Location Department of Public Safety, Division of Firefighter, Kuburma. Division of Fire and Emergency Services.